And not yet, I think. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. And it's wonderful to be back in, in Riga. And you did the weather perfectly. And uh, there's something very nostalgic at coming to this part of the world at this time of the year and having this beautiful Nordic light. Um, of course, the reason for coming here is, is uh, somewhat sad to me because Riga and Alf, for me, was, were very hard to, to separate. Uh, Alf was always there and always uh, very keen to have a drink, as, as you said. And, and um, I had uh, you know, many pleasurable uh, memories from, from um, those, those moments. And uh, I, I was actually, this is an extremely bad time for me to, to, to leave London because we are launching the thing that I have been working on for the last two years on Tuesday. But I really wanted to, to show how much um, I appreciated and, and respected uh, Alf. So I, that's, that's why I'm here and I'm very glad uh, to be here. Uh, Alf was truly unique. Um, I don't think I have met anyone quite like uh, Alf. Uh, Stephen went into many of his uh, intellectual contributions, but he was really, I mean, he was a, a real mensch, and he, um, you know, it was like he carried the entire 20th century of this country on his shoulders. I mean, you felt that here's someone who has uh, thought a lot about um, his country and what he wanted to do to his country. You know, he was you know, often grumbling, maybe sometimes a bit cynical, but deep down there was always humor and there was optimism in, in some uh, profound way. And just coming back to this country in, in the mid-90s uh, was a big step, I think. <clears throat> you know, it was not the, the happiest of times in, in, in Latvia, and um, you needed a lot of optimism, I think, to, to, make, to take that step that he did. But I think what, what really propelled him, and, and which propelled him also in, in what he did uh, with the biceps, was that he believed in the next generation. He believed that, that uh, there will be a, a better future for those who come next. And, and that, I think, what was really drove him. And, um, of course, that was something that drove very many people through that uh, uh, very difficult uh, period. And of course, many uh, uh, Stockholm School of Economics in Riga students have, have benefited from that belief in, in Alf. And um, he, um, you know, he could appear also in the strangest of places. You were traveling around the world, and suddenly there was Alf. And of course, he was always, uh, "Let's have a drink." And and um, and uh, whenever you saw him, he brought a smile to my to my face, and and there was always a, a sort of warm. Uh, uh, feeling uh, to to, um, to to meet uh, to meet him, and he was always uh, full of uh, good intentions, and um, so he will be be greatly missed. And I thought of, you know, what kind of um, talk should one give? Because I, I agree, Alf was not too interested in in the the econometrics. He wasn't too interested in in the uh, you know, the mathematical modeling. <laughs> he was he was very much a, a big picture person and a person that believed very much in in. The connection between policy and, and economics, and, and um, uh, of course, that's something that I, I sort of have to believe in because I have been trying to straddle that that world. And, and um, I think I, you know, in many ways, learned uh, uh, something from from Alf in, in that sense that he he really believed in this and, and he tried to implement it um, uh, on the ground. And, and if I had not made any contribution to, to to his work, it was the naming of biceps, which I'm very proud of which, um, of course, was uh, received first with some um, laughter, but it, it seemed to have stuck, and I'm very happy, uh, happy about that. So, so what I um, want to talk about, um, yeah, I have to find it, uh, is very much, uh, again, as I said, in the spirit of, of, um, of Alf. So it's, I'm going to try to, to talk about a, a concept or, or a a paradigm that um, is very dominant across emerging economies, wherever you go. Uh, this sense that there is some kind of trap that these countries are facing and, and why they cannot uh, escape. And, and uh, you know, this picture happens to be from, from China, but, uh, and, and in China certainly that is very present, and of course the whole legitimacy of the Communist Party 
rests on being able to to transcend uh, this uh, middle middle income trap. So here, just one second, you're still missing the picture. You're still missing the picture. It's uh, about it's, to come on. Oh, it's um, it's it's rare that I'm slower than I'm faster than the the technology. Is it? Um, it's a nice picture, so I want you to. <laughs> I don't think the picture is, at, the, at the moment is, is critical to what, to what I wanted to say. So, so again, this middle income trap is sort of a paradigm that you, you meet wherever you go to emerging economies. And, and actually, if you look at the, the record, very few countries uh, since 2000 have managed to make this journey. If you look at countries above a certain size, say uh, three, four million, there are actually only eight countries, depending a bit on how you count, and, and two in, in Latin America, two in Asia, and, and four in, in Europe. And um, if you go even further back, so maybe to the 1960s, uh, the record is even, even worse uh, than that, actually. But um, there's also a lot of evidence that, that there is actually no such thing as the middle income trap. It's, it seems that countries that have come into this middle income phase also grow much faster uh, during the middle income phase. And, uh, you know, it also strikes you as, as probably not being completely, you know, why would there be a certain level of income, given the differences across uh, economies, you know, whether they're not resource-based or they are, they are, you know, driven by manufacturing, driven by exports, whatever, you know. It, sorry. Uh, yeah. Just a small technical issue. Yeah. Sorry. Did, did I do this? No. It's... Um, Maybe Alf is, uh, <laughs> it's his, he got the last word. <laughs> no, because the slide don't appear. Okay. Just come back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this first picture is not so important, but the rest of the pictures are quite, quite, quite important. So. It's very nice, you can see it here actually. <laughs> we can so let's see. Okay. Ah no, it's yeah, it makes it makes a noise. So 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 as I said you know it se it seems very hard to believe that there in fact would be you know, a particular income level that would sort of trap you. So, so and, and a lot of this work that has been done to try to establish these kind of ranges where people, uh, where countries would get trapped, I think has been, you know, quite critical of this notion. But I think what, what no one can, can question is that um, the, the kind of growth you need when you are far away from the technology frontier is different from the kind of growth that you need when you are on the frontier. And um, also, going from the far away to the frontier to the frontier today is quite different from having done it maybe uh, 50 years ago, and, and certainly uh, also different from ha being uh, uh, the, what the UK and, and the, the US uh, did um, originally, who were the sort of leaders. So, so uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, how, how you think of this. Let's see. So, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is, um, is a, a big, quite ambitious project that uh, sort of follows in, in the tradition of the Spence Growth Commission. Some of you are probably familiar with this. It was a you know, very ambitious uh, project, uh, mainly uh, run by the, the World Bank with, with Michael Spence, the, the Nobel Laureate in Economics, as, as the head. And it was a very explorative and trying to, to understand growth uh, from many different perspectives, very eclectic and... and uh, 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 open, uh, uh, and that's also been the, some of the criticism against the Spence Growth Commission was that it it wasn't very useful actually in the end for for policy making. So, so um, Michael Spence and Joe Stiglitz have decided to to kind of revisit uh, this uh, Growth Commission, and unlike the Growth Commission had a, maybe mainly the focus on on middle income and and um, low income countries, these sort of Spence Stiglitz Transformation Commission, which um, actually will not, it hasn't been launched yet, it will be launched on May 25th, uh, 
is attempting to look at so the broader transformation of, of the world economy into a, a more sustainable, um, uh, both uh, environmentally and socially sustainable world. And um, this, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what I view as sort of the, the middle income aspect of this. So it's about those countries that have to move not only to the frontier, but they also have to do this uh, with um, the constraints of, um, of um, climate change constraints, uh, social constraints that are probably quite different from countries that went through this um, maybe 20, 30 or, or 100 years ago. So, so uh, in this part of the project, we, we have actually a, a number of uh, international financial institutions collaborating. We have an editorial team. We have a number of paper writers altogether. About 35 papers will be written under this project. Uh, and some of those papers are sort of global papers looking at, at specific themes. Others are looking at the specific experience of individual countries and trying to generate uh, sort of hypotheses that are then tested on, on a broader set of, of countries. And uh, what's very important about this, was, or again, it's just in the spirit of, of ALF, I think, is you know, this very close collaboration with local institutions in those countries that, that are the, the, the subject of this, um, of this study or this uh, report. So we hope that this report will be finished uh, uh, early next, next year. But uh, so what I'm going to report now is, is basically just very early thinking, and, and none of this work has really uh, been done yet. So, so, um, so again, uh, I spoke about this sort of dual, what I call the dual structural transformation. So it's on the one, uh, it's on the one hand moving from far away to the, or the frontier to the frontier, and the other is to go through this uh, transformation, and it's, it's both uh, a sort of transformation of, of, uh, towards sustainable, um, uh, a more sustainable economy, and it's, it's, it's a very rapid technological change at the moment, uh, you know, the AI revolution, the, well, whatever, the fourth industrial revolution, and all, all that, which is, I think, is, is affecting how you uh, view uh, this um, how do you catch up, actually? Because this, when, when the frontier is moving very fast, it, uh, you can also get stuck in technologies and so on that are no longer um, so valuable. And of course, the social and environmental constraints, are, again, are, are very different from what they were before. What is different about uh, this project is from maybe the Spence Commission was that it's, it's more narrow in its uh, conceptual framework. So we're trying to work basically with, with two sets of, of, of um, frameworks and, and trying to, to merge them uh, to the extent uh, we can. One is sort of the neo schumpeterian framework, which is, is, I guess, modern growth theory. Uh, particularly, Philippe Aguillon has been uh, the major contributor to that. The other uh, part that I will also bring in is the kind of state capacity literature. And um, there is particularly this book uh, about um, the pillars of prosperity, uh, looking at uh, development clusters and, and state transformation. So. The capacity of, of the state to, to implement different policies have to affect uh, what, what kind of policies you choose. So, so um, yes, very quickly, most of you are, um, are familiar with, with this, but the, so the neo schumpeterian growth framework really have, say, three main features. One is that it believes, and, and I think this is not just a matter of belief, it, it's uh, actually uh, a very important uh, fact that uh, long-run growth is, is from primarily driven by innovations. Again, innovation here is thought of in the very broad sense of things that are new uh, to uh, a particular uh, country and, and so it could be existing elsewhere and be uh, imitated or adapted to local circumstances. But that's what, what really drives uh, productivity. And um, innovations are driven by sort of entrepreneurial activities and these in turn are, are motivated by, by rents and, and that's going to be very important for understanding uh, you know, what are the implications of the nation material framework when you are at different stages of your development. And it, it's very fundamental, of course, it's this notion of creative destruction that comes from, from Schumpeter, where you, so new innovations displace uh, old technologies. So, so um, you know, one thing which is, you know, maybe the, the number one um, uh, implication of this, and which turns out to be quite important when you think about uh, policy, uh, in different countries, depending on, on how close they are to the, the world technology frontier, is, is, is the role of competition. So competition, of course, 
is something that we, we tend to embrace in, in, uh, generally, but competition actually has the, also the role of driving down entrepreneurial rent. So if you are in a far away from the frontier and you really need um, uh, to uh, drive uh, innovation, you need rents to, to in order to, to, um, to uh, uh, spur innovation, too much competition can actually uh, har harm you. And, and that, this is sort of a, a prediction. You have a competition on the horizontal axis and the growth of firms. So the, and the blue is of firms that are on the frontier, and the orange are firms that are not on the frontier. So the, the more competition actually drives down uh, growth of, of firms. And here's just an empirical uh, result. This is from a paper by Philippe Aguillon and, and co-authors, looking at on the uh, horizontal axis uh, foreign firm entry, which is sort of a proxy of, of competition, and then you have a total factor productivity growth. And again, you have f firms near the frontier and firms far away from the frontier. And when the, the competition increases, uh, it, um, it affects uh, growth uh, very differently in, in these firms. So, so um, another thing that also is quite different, again, this is also from a paper by um, Philippe Aguillon and, and, and some co-authors, uh, looking at the effect of um, educational spendings um, in, in, in different, um, in, in uh, so, so you have states, so this is in US states, states that are at the frontier, states that are further away from, from the frontier, and the point here is that you may actually not be so uh, be benefit so much from uh, sort of tertiary and, and, and advanced uh, uh, graduate education when you are far away from the frontier. That's when you really need uh, more like secondary education and, and uh, maybe you know two years college education. Or so. um, and here's uh, you know another kind of stylized fact that that um, uh, is related to this. So here's the um, you have. Uh, firm age uh, on the horizontal, and you have um, the size of the firm measured here by the number of employees. So you see in, 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 um, in, uh, at the frontier, you know, uh, when the firm grows uh, uh, and, and, uh, or ages, it also uh, grows, grows in size. But this is not true uh, in, in many countries. It's not true in India. It's, you know, it's, mostly or at least uh, to, a, to a certain level um, or above a certain level not true in, in Mexico either. And I remember the work we did in Russia, you know, there was really a, a kind of ceiling or very difficult for firms to, to grow uh, beyond. So this is something that is, you know, quite uh, widely um, uh, observed. Um, another thing which also is important and, and very relevant for what we're talking about is, is that the sort of distribution of firm productivity is very different. Not only is the, the, um, the average and, and the median uh, very different, but you can see also that um, the, um, the spread out of, of firms is much greater in, in India. So it's, so it's not only about getting uh, the most uh, productive firms more productive, but it's really a lot also about uh, phasing out firms that are less productive uh, in, in the economy. So, so, um, so here is a, a, a kind of, and it's very uh, cluttered, but it's a, it's a kind of interesting uh, set of um, results. Uh, comes from a kind of survey article that um, uh, a couple of authors uh, at the IMF has done. It's basically taking, uh, looking at the connection between growth and a number of institutional variables. And, and the point here is not to dig down in details, but the point is that depending on whether you are um, an advanced market economy, an emerging market economy, or a less uh, developed uh, economy, that the types of institution that matter for growth are different. So the darker the um, the uh, uh, whatever rectangles here or boxes here, the the more it matters for growth. And but the, the, what I want you to take away is just that it is quite different. We'll come back to uh, uh, in a minute uh, what the differences are like. So so this is the most important uh, slide that I'm going to show. This is basically trying to to capture 
what the middle income trap is in, in, in a sort of uh, conceptual sense. And, and it, so the middle income trap in, in this literature is about the, tra the can transformation, the transition from investment-led growth to, to uh, innovation-led growth. And um, uh, for example, here uh, on, on the, yes, to try to illustrate this, you have the People's Republic of China in 1990, People's Republic of China in 2016, and People's uh, Republic uh, of China maybe um, in a few years from now. And, and so clearly uh, China started uh, growing um, very much uh, based on, on uh, you know, of course, initially some fundamental reforms, but then it was really investment-led growth. But what's happening in China right now is that it's actually very successfully managing to, to climb up uh, the value added uh, ladder and, and, and is, is quite successful in transforming towards uh, innovation-led growth. But, of course, how uh, effective it will be is, is still uh, very much an open, an open issue. But this is, uh, again, the way, I think, to, to capture uh, the middle income trap uh, conceptually. So, so um, just to summarize what I've tried to say now is that you know, enhancing productivity growth in advanced countries is quite different from, from uh, doing it in, in sort of emerging economies. So when you are at the frontier, when you are uh, an advanced economy, it's about investment in higher education, and particularly in, in sort of graduate education, uh, higher tertiary, uh, so masters and uh, PhDs and so on, become very important. They may not be as important when you are far away from the frontier. Uh, liberalization of product markets is very important because it's going to be about entry and exit of firms. It's going to be um, about... Um, and, and, and so I emphasize both entry and exit, so also facing out firms that are less productive. Liberalization of labor markets, so, so encouraging uh, transfer of, of labor across firms, uh, new and, 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 and out of old firms. Uh, liberalization of financial markets, uh, also uh, important. When you look at emerging economies, it's, it's quite different because now the was very important these countries are going to depend on uh, imitating and, and, and adapting technology. So uh, whatever way you manage, but you, you want to try to foster technology transfers, you want to re reallocate factors across um, the economy, uh, across sectors. And, and uh, so less about um, this churning of, of firms, but it's really about major uh, reallocation across uh, sectors. Uh, what's, there's a lot of work now in trying to show the importance of management practices and, and certainly it's something that I strongly believe in uh, and we, I think we have much better tools now for, for measuring this and it seems to be particularly important when you're uh, talking about emerging economies. And um, you can sort of address these levers directly but also indirectly. So. You know, bringing down corruption, something we will come back to, to later this afternoon, you know, relaxing uh, credit constraints, improving educational quality. So these things uh, you have an impact on the management, for example. Reducing corruption is something that can help, I think, improve management or, or, and vice versa for that matter. And um, improving educational quality can also help, uh, uh, hopefully, management. So, so um, this is a, it kind of characterizing the middle income trap, looking at, at uh, some uh, cross-country evidence, and I'll now try to look a little bit more closely at um, the experience, particularly in, in emerging Europe, because emerging Europe, and particularly Central Europe, actually seem to have been able to avoid largely uh, the middle income trap. So again, we, we don't take a stand now whether um, you know, this is a... Um, a, a um, general uh, trap, or that there, it's likely that firms, that, that the countries that come into a certain uh, income get stuck or not. That might be true elsewhere, but it doesn't seem to be true in in, um, in Central Europe. So, so the question is, uh, you know, why? Well, so, so what what happened in in emerging Europe? Well, uh, you know, the initial reforms brought total factor productivity from very low levels, so they were extremely low, also compared to countries at the same level of, of income. And uh, what happens with these initial reforms is that they became 
more like other emerging economies. And, and Latvia became also more like other emerging economies in terms of, of its um, uh, total factor productivity. And it was driven very much by economic openness and, and of course, the anchor of EU uh, accession was very important for that process. Uh, it was kind of both top-down, so, uh, you know, the whole uh, accession process of, of uh, adopting legal frameworks and, and, and enforcement practices and so on. But it was also very much bottom-up, you know, through foreign direct investment, and, and you know, both in the uh, uh, real sector, but also in the financial sector. And of course, this country has seen uh, a lot of, of both of these. Uh, and, and, but we can say that you know, in many cases, the, the agenda is, of reform is still incomplete. And there is, um, in many countries in Central Europe now, a, a growing pushback against reforms and, and uh, also more focus, perhaps, on the distributional impact of reforms, which have you know, were not on the focus of, of most um, policymakers um, during this transformation. So, so um, if, we, if you look at this process a little bit more closely, and, and there is a very interesting paper that I will uh, um, quote uh, a little bit from now, which is um, a paper by uh, uh, Laszlo Brust and Nauru Campos, which takes the... Um, annual assessments of the European Commission of uh, the state of reforms in, uh, in these accession countries. And, and I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at these documents. They are you know, quite elaborate and, and very, very detailed, very um, kind of formulaic, but, but um, you know, very um, granular in the descriptions of, of uh, how far a um, particular country has come in, in, in different respects. Uh, you know, some people may say that these were sort of political documents, but actually I don't think uh, they were very much. They were actually driven by sort of expert assessments and, uh, and uh, trying to, you know, of course related to a particular kind of institutional model, but um, that has been the model that has been uh, um, progressively uh, adopted in, in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So, you know, it's sort of progress... Uh, compared to that, to that model. So, so what uh, uh, Laszlo Brust and, and Naro Campos did, they, they took these reports for seriously. So they had them coded, and, and you know, probably you, some of you have seen the, this paper, which I think is a very, very interesting paper, because it, it sort of allows you to start to, to look at the, the connections between uh, different aspects of, um, of reforms and different aspects of institutions. So, so um, you know, what institutions are important for, for what, and, and maybe I'll move uh, immediately to, to this. So they, what they look at, they look at um, development of the judicial sector, so it's about uh, the uh, judicial independence, it's about judicial uh, competence, um, it's, uh, they look at uh, the, um, the bureaucracy, so it's again the, the independence of the bureaucracy, and the capacity of the, of the bureaucracy. And finally, they look at the implementation of, of competition policy, which is kind of a, a, a measure of, of um, how, how effective the state is. And this is something that we by now have you know, quite a lot of experience how to, how to measure. And, and so, so what, um, they, they are just a few things that stand out from a you know, very rich paper, and I, I don't, cannot really uh, do justice to it here. But it's, um, it, it, first of all, it's clear that and it stands out, you know, market liberalization on its own is, is not sufficient. You need institutions that enforce uh, competition policy. You need uh, institutions that uh, enforce all kinds of, of regulation and, and that does it in an independent way and, and not subject to, to, to uh, corruption, for example. And um, but what, what, what they managed to do is that they can look at, you know, what inputs are important for determining whether... Um, a particular um, competence uh, uh, is is uh, is present, or whether a a um, particular uh, so whether the judiciary is uh, is competent, or whether it's uh, independent, and it then correlates these sort of inputs, which can may have, for example, it is often said that if you just raise wages of of uh, bureaucrats, you will get them more 
motivated in, in there, at least if you believe uh, this study, uh, that, that doesn't, that's not true. But what is important is to, to really make sure that the caseloads are controlled. So, so when caseloads grow very rapidly for the judiciary, then uh, they, um, you know, the, the um, uh, capacity of the, of the um, judiciary uh, goes down also. So, so th they, they establish certain things that are important to, to, um, to the function of the judiciaries. What are, they show very much also that both judicial and bureaucratic capacity is critical for the enforcement of competition policy. So perhaps not uh, um, surprising, but it's something that in, in most studies have not really been picked up earlier. Uh, for, and the, the role of the Supreme Courts uh, for judicial independence, you know, something that is very much on, 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 on the um, agenda now in, in Poland, for example, where, where you're actually threatening the independence. But, and, and so it's, it seems like of all the different measures to have a judicial independence, uh, the, uh, have a functioning Supreme Court is very important. Anyhow, I wanted just to give you sort of, uh, because I think this is um, a way of understanding uh, this uh, transformation and what is needed to go from, uh, from um, middle income to high income. And, 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 and I think uh, this kind of transformation of state capacity, expansion of, of state capacity, uh, uh, give, getting a state that is capable of, of implementing more complicated, more sophisticated um, uh, re uh, policies, that's what this paper is describing, and using the experience of, of, um, of um, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe. So, so, um, so I was going to come now to, to um, kind of the, the, uh, the main theme uh, of industrial policy and how this is, um, relates to, to the middle income trap. And uh, with these two aspects, both um, the, the Schumpeterian view of trying to uh, look at what, uh, what drives productivity and on the other hand looking at what determines state capacity. So, so this paper that I just went through is sort of trying to understand how state capacity grows and, and, and what determines uh, state capacity. So industrial policy is really, you know, it's growth policy essentially in, in the new, new, new Schumpeterian world. Uh, and um, industrial policy is trying to affect you know, both, um, and it, I mean, it's trying to move uh, countries closer to the frontier, but it does so potentially both by affecting average across industries, average within industries, and of course also individual firms. So these are the, the kind of what, what industrial policy is trying to affect, and, and of course what I'm going to try to, to show is that some of this may be more or less possible under different uh, um, levels of state uh, capacity. So, so um, when we look at, at the industries, you know, and, and I, I showed you earlier the, the picture with um, India and the US, and so the heterogeneity within industries is much more important in emerging economies. So we have many uh, you know, inefficient firms and, and you, know, you can either move these firms closer to the frontier or you can phase them out. This is, and, and of course that would affect the average across industries either way, but um, what is particularly important, I think, in, in, at, at this phase of development is to transfer uh, resources from low productivity sectors to, to high productivity sectors. Uh, and and it, so in the industrial policy becomes about compressing firm distributions by phasing out and upgrading laggards. It's about um, uh, abandoning uncompetitive industries and it's about upgrading leading uh, firms. So, th so this is, of course, if you're going to do all this, this requires a lot uh, from the state, and, and that's what I'm going to, going to talk about now. So, so, so what are the different types of, of industrial policy? Well, there's the traditional horizontal policies. These were sort of uh, the kind of Washington consensus, the, the sort of generally accepted type of uh, policies. Was, they were technology neutral. It was about promoting um, education, it was about uh, uh, promoting competition, which I already suggested is not always uh, uh, advantageous. Uh, but there was, there was sort of a consensus that vertical policies were, were not really um, uh, something that you wanted because vertical policies were uh, easily captured, the state was not very good at uh, 
determining who's who's a winner, who's a loser. Um, there are many examples, of course, of, of failed attempts of vertical policy. So there was this whole uh, world of sort of compromises, or, or, or uh, not compromises, but um, um, in the intermediate world, what we call sector-oriented horizontal policies. So these are different policies um, that try to address either specific uh, issues in, in individual sectors, so maybe there are some skill shortages uh, in a particular sector need to be addressed, or um, uh, there may be some financing constraints that apply to a particular sector. So this is the kind of, also, I think, generally accepted that this is, uh, this is something that you could aspire to with industrial policy. You could maybe try to promote sector-based innovation so you can have policy that uh, apply to, for example, aerospace and, and, and try to do, the, do that. The, another type of policy is uh, what you call smart specialization. So this is taking, um, for example, IT technology into traditional sectors like agriculture or textiles or, or biochemistry into to the uh, uh, textile industry. You, it may be about, um, uh, and, and, and this is something that is been very important for EU, um, uh, uh, sort of, the EU has tried to promote uh, this very much, particularly in, in, in uh, Central and Southern Europe, but, but uh, in general this has been part of sort of accepted industrial policy within the European Union. Uh, the, the final uh, form that I mention here is sort of a more coordinating role, trying to connect individual firms and sectors to global value chains. And, and given the importance of value chains um, uh, uh, and the kind of the world has changed now so that you can actually globalize just in a very small part of a value chain you can instead of having to produce a full car you can produce a gearbox and, and in that way uh, become uh, globally competitive so it's, it's in a way easier for emerging economies in this sense to to um, to become competitive, to move to the frontier, because that you can do it in a, in a very narrow way. And of course, uh, the, the last form of uh, industrial policy that I want to mention is uh, intelligent public procurement. So it's also something that relates to the topic of this panel later, which is uh, you know, corruption. And, and if you can actually do intelligent procurement, both in terms of, of uh, trying to target uh, high growth segments, but they also can uh, reduce uh, corruption and, 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 and uh, capture through uh, public procurement. That's a good thing. So, so there is sort of a, a more extreme form of, of, um, of industrial policy, which broadly you can maybe characterize by this term, the entrepreneurial states. It's um, Mariana Mazzucato who has uh, a book with this name. And this has a, a much more ambitious uh, approach to, to the role of the state. It's about states essentially as, as you venture capitalists. It takes sort of portfolio approach. So it, it takes a lot of risks, but because it has a, a portfolio industry-wide or economy-wide portfolio, um, it, it, uh, it can do this. Uh, it sort of sets direction and, and puts in place roadmaps. It tries to facilitate uh, sector dialogues, improve assessment tools, uh, use evidence-based learning, it develops markets, you know, for example, you know, in the renewables, feed-in tariffs to, to, to get renewable energy going and so on. It crowds in private capital, particularly institutional capital. But all this is very uh, demanding on, on the institution and, and uh, easy leads to, to capture. So there's a whole range of, sort of, uh, of different industrial policy where on the one hand you have horizontal policies and then you have on the other hand what I call here, the, the entrepreneurial state. And, and here's just an example. These are two US uh, examples of, of Tesla on the one hand, which is, a, you know, it's often portrayed, portrayed as you know, entrepreneurial. Of course, it is entrepreneurial, but it's also heavily subsidized, subsidized by taxpayers. But so far, it seems to have been broadly a success. The, the other, other side of this is Solyndra, which was a, you know, a major um, uh, investment, a demonstration piece for the Obama administration that basically went belly up, literally. And, and um, so, so, so this is, of course, um, the entrepreneurial state take, can take risks, but it's also, um, you know, the, the, the failures are, are, are um, significant, uh, or the chance of failure is significant. So here's basically 
the very simple message th that I have, you know, when you think about industrial policies, you need to bring this uh, together with, uh, with the capacity of the state. So if these sort of um, are demands on the state capacity in, in sort of ascending order, so horizontal policies actually m most middle-income countries can, can implement, but uh, the entrepreneurial state is, is, is uh, you know, something that can lead to, to capture, can lead to a lot of, of uh, uh, misinvestments and, and, uh, and, um, and also, by the way, um, corruption. So, so um, let me summarize uh, here. So industrial policy in emerging economies. So uh, increased competition is not necessarily positive if you're off the frontier. And again, it has to do with the need to have rents to, to foster um, um, uh, innovation. You, um, and, and, and a lot of the innovation in, in, um, at, in, at that state comes from existing firms. So it's not about the entry and an exit uh, um, of firms. It's more about the evolution and, and, and growth of, of uh, existing firms. There is, um, and should be an emphasis on coordination to achieve economies of scale. So it's, it's a lot about adaptation and imitation. It's a lot about scale, and that uh, the state can can play a role. Financial mobilization through banks important of frontiers. So it's not so much about venture capital and 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 so on. It, it's really about getting uh, investment and, and um, channeling that through, through the banking sector. So you need a sound banking sector to, to work. Secondary education is critical, and, and tertiary education becomes important, but it's maybe not um, you know, the type of, of, uh, sort of advanced uh, tertiary education. Vocational training is, is very critical at, at this stage. IP protection, openness, and competition are, you know, are sort of complements uh, and, and um, well, we can come back to that maybe in, in the discussion. The anti barriers and corruption are more important closer to the frontier. So, um, uh, of course, if you want to encourage ent exit and entry, you know, anti barriers become you know, a, a, a huge issue. Uh, you want to foster technology transfer, but of course, here the issue is what technology. So, if you know. You know, if there are well-established technologies where you really it's for you to adapt and uh, or or just imitate, that's less demanding on the state than if you have to select on technologies that are more or less uh, uh, new or, or um, at least uh, not so so well established. You you want to reallocate factors across firms and across industries. So um, this is again something that uh, you you want to use industrial policy. You, you, you can try to do uh, improve management practices. If you succeed, that has lot, uh, lots of returns, but it's not so easy to do, of course. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, incumbents and insiders may frustrate movement to frontier, so this is clearly something that, that you worry about, and, and I think often the reason why, despite uh, this um, downside of competition, uh, you sometimes still want to uh, keep an openness because you want to prevent uh, current capture. So, so, um, yeah. So, so, so um, let me. Yeah, I can just give you a few examples. Of, uh, I'll, I think I'll s summarize with this slide. So, so what I there is sort of a paradox of industrial policy. Where it's most needed, where you really would like to move very fast, and and you would um, like to to um, to uh, and, 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 the, and the pressures to to grow um, and and grow uh, within these constraints that I said before, the environmental and and social constraints. Unfortunately, the um, the state capacity may not be there to achieve uh, those. Um, very um, rapid um, innovation growth. So industrial policies have to focus on, on more modest objectives of, of, um, uh, than maybe the entrepreneurial state that I spoke about. Horizontal policies um, can, uh, if they just focus on competition, can be counterproductive. Firm-specific vertical policies can, are very vulnerable to capture and uncertainty. And, and of course, the entrepreneurial state is sort of the extreme. 
Sector-specific policies are less demanding on institutions, but they're still vulnerable to capture and, and vulnerable to uncertainty in particular. So you, you may, the particular sector may actually uh, lose in competitiveness over, over time. As I said, entrepreneurial state is extremely demanding on institutions, but it could be disciplined by outside anchors, for example, the EU accession, but also some of these deep trade agreements that have been discussed, uh, TPP and, and TTIP and, and so on. These have um, elements of, of um, kind of outside anchors that can help uh, uh, push institutional development. And, and there are um, many successful examples of combining uh, sector support and, and connecting firms to uh, global value chains. And, and as I said, this is something that is easier today probably than it was, uh, was before. Um, you can do ITC upgrades. This is kind of smart specialization. You can uh, try to link up to, to, to outside anchors. It's, of course, it's often uh, geographically determined, but um, if you can connect to, to, like China did, for example, to the WTO, um, um, it, it had a very positive impact on institutional development and growth in, in China. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. If we maybe can keep uh, Eric here for a couple of questions before we uh, end. Um, I, I think in sort of the spirit of Alf and the big picture that we heard that was sort of his speciality from both of you, uh, now we're, we're looking at sort of getting out of a middle income trap uh, and we're using sort of history of, of what we've learned over time and sort of trying to figure out what's relevant for whom, and et cetera. At the same time, you mentioned how the world is changing. So how should we think of this sort of big picture challenge of, of using our old growth models or strategies in a world which may actually look very, very different when these countries are, are going to develop? I mean, you mentioned artificial intelligence. We have sort of 3D printing, we have all sorts of technologies ahead of us that we're not really used to. How do you think sort of the, sort of the growth discussion will look uh, when we meet here again in 25 years? Well, sorry, so um, I, I tried to allude to this and, and, and uh, so, so I do think that this transformation that these countries have to go through is very different from what countries had to go through, uh, say, maybe 30, 40 years ago. And it um, doesn't mean that we cannot learn something from, from, the, from those transformations. And particularly in this project, we focus on those countries that went through this transformation since 2000. Of course, the trap here is if you look at only the successful cases, you, you, you have a, a selection problem. So it's really about trying to understand... Uh, both the failures and, and the successes uh, 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 in, in, the, in, in that historical data. But if you want to take this forward, a few things that, that I think matters. So, so I, I mentioned this kind of, there's um, a book that probably many of you have seen uh, called The Great Convergence by Richard Baldwin, which kind of captures uh, you know, some of the you know, fundamental trades, trends towards you know, the, what really matters today is the transfer of information uh, across uh, boundaries and, and uh, the ability of individual firms to control these information flows and prevent, um, uh, 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 you know, dissemination of, of, of uh, technologies and, 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 um, and know-how uh, outside those uh, firm networks. And, and I think what what really going to be important in, in the future is how can emerging economies benefit from these, uh, from these global value chains. So on the one hand, uh, it's easier today to become, uh, uh, get to the frontier in a more narrow sense. So again, I use the example of the car. You don't need to produce a whole car. You can become uh, uh, competitive in just gearboxes, for example. And, and so I think that's very different from, from, from the history. So here, you know, so, so 
I would put a lot more emphasis today maybe than historically on, on joining these global value chains. Of course, you can say that they maybe didn't exist in the same way in the past, but, but certainly uh, that is something that is, is important. The other, I talked about this dual transformation, that one is to go to the frontier, and I focused a lot on moving to the frontier, but um, you know, a lot of the transformation has to do with um, the environmental transformation, the, the um, adjust, adjustment to climate change and so on. That, that often involves you know, uh, interventions by governments, and we know, you know we, we are going through that uh, in, in the advanced economies now, you know, introducing renewables and, and, and um, uh, getting um, you know, more uh, efficient energy uh, use. A lot of that comes from state interventions and heavy subsidies. My concern is that this is you know, very difficult in some of these middle-income countries to get to work because it requires a very sophisticated state. And we have seen, for example, the attempts to, to use feed-in tariffs in Eastern Europe, for example. I mean, look at Ukraine, look at, at, at a number of countries that tried to use this and it became captured by, by oligarchs and, and um, you, you, you um, sort of poured a lot of government resources into, into um, uh, basically uh, Swiss bank accounts. And, and um, I think so... so Some of these new elements of, of the, uh, the transformation, they, um, you, you have to be very careful for, for when introducing them in middle-income countries. You need to, to really um, look at what these different incentive instruments, you know, how demanding are they for, for state capacity. We will soon uh, invite questions from the floor, but I think we owe Charles uh, the first question from the floor. Is this something you would like to... <laughs> I only have one question. Thanks yeah. very much. You mentioned the role of the judicial system, the significance mm. of that. Mm. Could you just give a little bit more insight in the context of, mm. of the general issue of institutions mm. and industrial policy? Mm. Well, so I think it's a lot about judicial, you know, it's about the rules of the game, and it's about both the the independence of judicial decisions, so, uh, and, and it's about the capacity of the judicial system to ensure that whatever decisions it takes are actually enforced. And, and what, um, what um, that study that I mentioned does uh, in, in terms of interpreting the, the experience of, of Central Eastern Europe shows that judicial independence is, is critical, for example, to the enforcement of competition policy. I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious when you think about it, but it stands out as particularly important. And then they have some interesting discussion of what exactly shapes uh, judicial independence, and, and that's where they emphasize the existence of an independent Supreme Court. So, you know, again, it's not surprising, but there are many other things that you thought mattered, but didn't, doesn't seem to matter if you, if you believe um, uh, this study. So, questions from the floor? Okay, Kostya. Hi, Kostya. <laughs> I didn't see you. Uh, so, my question, uh, it's in, in the spirit of uh, uh, Alf. Uh, you said that your main slide, um, you showed the main slide and there was the middle income trap, but yeah. this was a theoretical, theoretical uh, slide. Do you have any kind of an illustration of, like, why do we have the middle income trap? Why would why are you sure that there is such thing as middle income trap? No, no, I, I, well, what so, are the examples of this? Yeah. What, so, are, so, so, what so, is so, the evidence of this? Yeah. So, so, so first of all, I, I, I think I made very clear from the beginning, I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a middle income trap. I, I said that there is something uh, that has to happen to institutions when you go from far away to the frontier. To, to the, to the frontier. As I said, uh, you know, countries that grew faster as middle-income countries, uh, or, or as low-income countries, or, and, and as lower-middle-income countries, tend to grow faster also as upper-middle-income countries. So that suggests that this trap may not be there, but you still have to try to understand, you know, what is it that makes certain countries capable of making this institutional transformation? And, so it's, and, and I, you know, I think the, the sort of subtext of your question is that, in, and, and, and there's quite a lot of empirical refutations of, of 
of the middle income trap, which doesn't mean that there is not a uh, you know, fundamental challenge of, of transforming the, the, the institutions. So I don't think that's true, actually. I think that, that period was a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think the general point is I think these countries did, you know, quite well um, in, in uh, also in relative terms, and also in absolute terms, uh, uh, after the initial uh, um, recession, uh, in, which was very long in, 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 in this country, for example. But... Uh, but if you look at, at the record until uh, the global financial crisis, I think there was you know, quite strong growth. And in some countries, the problems of growth started earlier, um, like it did, in, by the way, in, in much of, of the world. I think I'm, I'm trying to sort of think what, what would Alf have asked if, yeah. if he was standing here. Yeah. And I mean, he obviously had a keen interest in policy and in Latvia. Mm -hmm. So how is this relevant to Latvia and, and what, mm. what should Latvia be doing here mm. today given what you just told us? Yeah. So first of all, I think that Latvia was, is quite far along in, in this uh, transformation and, and, and certainly I've only been here now for, for about two hours, I guess, but, but I, I already, and, and it's been, I guess, a couple of years since I was here last. And, and certainly I feel that there, in terms of just the... Um, Perception is that things have, have certainly uh, improved since since the the um, the very dark times also uh, when in in the recent crisis in in Latvia. But but um, what I think is is uh, important here and and, and I think has uh, played a role um, in, in in Latvia has first of all been of course the you know, if you came here 15 years ago and you looked at the the role of, of um, certain uh, individuals in politics, in, in economics, and so I, it seems to me, at least, that this has has improved. It's not gone away, but it's it certainly seemed to be a bit more competitive uh, uh, political field. Uh, I think that is something that um, you know, certainly has improved, and also makes it possible to implement uh, maybe more sophisticated policies. Because what you worried about in the past in that kind of structure is that that any effort by the state to intervene in the economy, and particularly selecting among sectors and, and, and even more so among firms, would have been captured by, by strong economic interests. So, so I, my sense is that that, um, that is less of an issue now, but it's not uh, gone away completely. I think what I would think about is, is um, the, um, this kind of what I'd call sector based horizontal policies. So things like smart specialization, trying to introduce, for example, um, IT technology in, in some traditional sectors. Coming down here in this beautiful uh, weather, looking at the, it, you know, it, it doesn't look like um, sort of forestry here and, or agriculture is, is, is very advanced and, and maybe there is scope for, for introducing um, more of, of um, uh, modern technology in, in those sectors. And, I think we're running short, but we'll have one last question, please. Hi. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to, to follow up the previous one. Mm -hmm. So let's take one particular example from Latvia, and you tell us whether the outcome is, is good based on what you told. Mm -hmm. So we have these feed-in tariffs. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, they have been somehow allocated to firms affiliated to mm. those in power 10, 12 years ago. Mm. Now we have recently uh, uh, one of the largest Latvian enterprises, a steel producer, who has actually c has come out of business m m to a large extent due to this uh, feed-in tariff, this electricity component in, in their cost is huge. On the other hand, this Enterprise was not at the frontier. He, mm. It was at the frontier on some one component of production, but mm. far from the frontier on the other. 
so and uh, uh, institution quality so uh, this enterprise has been sold to new investors from from ukraine who the, the whole process have been somehow compromised by not very high institutional quality mm. but nevertheless should we consider the outcome this this stale producer is out of the market we have this feed-in tariffs for electricity forget about those who benefits from these tariffs. Mm. Do we have a good outcome as a result based on this theory? Well, I think what you illustrated was maybe more the, the, the potential downsides uh, of this. Uh, so I don't, I don't know the specific case of the steel uh, producer, so I, I shouldn't comment on that. But, but what I warned against was this, uh, that some of these schemes that are associated with this sort of sustainability transformation can easily be captured in, in a place like, like Latvia. And, and um, uh, you know what you described. I, I think I, I, I do know a little bit about uh, what, you know what happened uh, in, in those in those uh, schemes. Whether you know it, it seems like this steel producer could not have been competitive. It probably was a good thing that it that it um, it did, was phased out. But I don't know enough about the you know how it was done and 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 uh, whether indeed there was some way in which it could have continued staying competitive. You know, it probably, you know, my guess is that the electricity costs were, even if they were very high, they did not fully reflect uh, the, uh, you know, the um, environmental costs and the, the, um, the um, climate change premium and, and so on. So if you add all those on top, my, I'm pretty sure that the, the power uh, cost would have been even higher for for this steel producer in in Latvia, but that's, is, am I wrong? <laughs> Maybe I can suggest that we continue the discussion over coffee downstairs. You will actually have a chance to talk to and listen to Eric mm -hmm. after the break. We'll have a panel then, which I think also Charles will be joining mm -hmm. you up here. But I think before we go down to coffee. I have to say, I think this discussion and, and having Charles here yeah. would have really made Alf happy yeah. uh, and excited. Yeah. And uh, he would certainly have taken you a drink afterwards yeah. for this, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, but for now, we're just going to give you a big warm hand of thanks to Charles thanks, and to Charles. Eric. Thanks.